Welcome to the Modern Crypt Theology Podcast. We're so delighted that you're, you've are you joined us today. And Miriam and I are excited to welcome our guests, Laura and Alan. So Laura and Alan, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves. Laura, would you mind starting for us? Sure. Um, I'm Laura McGregor. I worked with uh, Dr. Alan Jorgensen to complete this project, which was a research project funded by the Louisville Institute, where we uh, spent time with uh, interviewing families, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, yeah, I don't really feel I have much more to say other than work colleague of Alan's and uh, worked with Alan on the project. Thanks, Laura. And Laura is a veteran here at the podcast. She's been on many times. So we're so happy that you're back here with us today. And Alan, welcome. Thanks so much. Um, since I'm new to the podcast, maybe I'll give a little bit more of a description. Um, so I'm Assistant Dean at Martin Luther University College, where I teach theology. Um, I'm a seemingly able-bodied, straight, white, settler, cisgendered male who is well-educated, and I describe myself as dreadfully rich in comparison to the majority of the population. Uh, maybe to give you a bit of a picture of myself as well visual, um, I'm a late middle, I guess I call myself a late middle-aged ma male, um, balding on the top, my kids remind me of that from time to time, graying hair, which I take as a sign of hopefully um, uh, aging wisdom, let's go with that. Um, I'm in my office at home. There's a picture behind me of uh, um, on Lake Ontario sky with lots of clouds uh, against a nice bright blue background. Um, it kind of, it's a painting that makes me happy because it comes from the picture I took on my sailboat. Um, I'm wearing a plaid, plaid uh, shirt that's checkered with kind of purple, blue, pink whites. So there's a bit of a picture of who I am. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here. It's great to be with you three. Thanks so much, Alan. It's great to great for our listeners to get a sense of who you are. Um, we are so excited about your book, Amy, of course, work with you lied on it as part of the Mandan Corp Theology Press, but they wondered if you would share how the book came about and what, what, what in the book for readers to discover. So, Anyone can jump in and add. I'll, I'll just quickly start by waving the book about so that people can see a picture of it. So, um, and then pass the baton over to Laura. <laughs> oh, okay, great. I'll catch the baton. Um, okay, so the Beyond Saints and Superheroes uh, book, which Alan and I published with the Mad and Crypt Theology Press back in March of 2023, um, summarizes a, a, the project that we uh, did with funds from the Louisville Institute, exploring the experiences of parents raising children with disabilities within the context of the church. And to sort of briefly summarize the project, we did a qualitative project, which means we interviewed 20 parents who are raising children with disabilities about their experience with, with church. And we used the, the language of Facebook to invite people to talk about their relationship with church. So are you in a relationship with church, not in a relationship with church, or was it, quote, complicated? And uh, we tried to have a balance of people who could tell a variety of stories. So we didn't want to interview people who were exclusively in a relationship with church or who were uh, avoiding church or who defined it as complicated. And the book... Uh, is organized around images, which I think we'll talk about uh, in a bit. And each short chapter offers a reflection on an image, and we can talk a little bit about how we got those images at some point. 
And we also use prompts for discussion. So there are uh, questions that we would encourage people to either think about or talk about or journal about, um, depending on whether they're engaging in this individually or with a group. There are Bible passages, there's poetry, and there's some really lovely uh, sketches that were completed by a local artist, which try to bring the images to life. Um, what would you like to add, Alan? Um, so yeah, I, I mean, right from the get go, the the proposal to Louis, the Louisville Institute, who um, thankfully funded this, and so we're uh, very great, grateful to them for their support of that. Um, the proposal spoke about um, looking at this in the context of Canadian church life. Um, so in some ways, the book is very much aimed at that that targeted that group of people um, and so I think has a lot of potential around that. I, I would also hope, however, that the book has um, the potential of going a bit beyond that, that people from other faith communities could take a look at this book and go, okay, how does this translate or not in in our, in my mosque or my temple or wherever? So um, hopefully it can have a bit of a broader reading, but that definitely is the it was the target in, in the narrower sense. Yeah, and I I just want to oh sorry go ahead Miriam. It's a follow up. I should know this, but were the were the contemporaries ecumenical? So were they a different Christian denominations? Yeah, sorry, I'm looking to Alan wondering which one of us might jump in. But yes, so they were from a, a collection of diverse Christian traditions, um, but all were were Christian or who had been Christian. And I think that might be uh, sort of a noteworthy addition that we certainly talked to people who had originally identified with the Christian faith or who had been active in Christian communities, but had withdrawn completely or partially. I was, uh, thank you for that, Laura. I was just going to jump in and say uh, what a delight it was, uh, if I put my publisher hat on now, what a delight it was for the Mad and Crypt Theology Press to be able to work with both of you as authors. Um, and I think we all learned a lot from one another uh, as we journeyed through this book. And um, it was so incredible to see both of you um, put this together in a way that was so accessible for so many different kinds of folks. Um, I think as uh, when the idea was being birthed, you had mentioned that um, you wanted it to be kind of jargon free or as most accessible as possible for as many folks as possible. And I, I hope that we we um, were able to to do that. So so we briefly talked a bit about who the book is for. Um, we wanted to ask you, why did you decide to write this as a practical guide? Why was that important for you both? Um, I think it's important for me, I'll, I'll just speak from my perspective for starters. I mean, one of the things is I've sort of journeyed into this, and thank you, Laura, for the opportunity to be a part of this. This was really her her idea, and she invited me along, and I've learned so much along the way. But as I kind of reflect back on my own experience in being trained as a, as a, as a I'm a Lutheran pastor as well as a professor, um, my training is in ministry, my MDiv, we simply didn't touch this material at all which is, um, you know, aside from inspiration porn here and there. Um, but aside from that, it's it, my, my church community itself simply didn't talk about this. Um, so, you know, the experience of discovering how much I didn't know, um, I think was for me, I, I was very excited about the idea of how can we make this something that can you know, land well in pews, in, in church communities at a kind of a local level. Um, and I, hopefully that's where we've arrived. I, I kind of feel that way anyways. Yeah, and I think I can share that. Um, and I've talked about this before on podcasts. This book really and the research project really emerged out of my own lived experience as the parent of a significantly disabled young man for 21 years and it really um 
it really grew out of my own disillusionment with church and uh, the the journey of being very actively involved in church and strongly identifying with the faith community to a complete withdrawal um, because I felt that my son and by extension my family weren't uh, weren't particularly welcome though I'm struggling with the right word welcome may not be the right term but churches wanted to welcome us there was no doubt about that but they they didn't know how to um and and once we arrived i became frustrated with some of the more inspirational porn type mess- messages that i felt my family was and my son were on the receiving end of and so i really wanted to write uh write something that spoke directly to people who either were faith leaders within faith communities or were members of faith communities or the families themselves. I wanted the families to be able to see their experiences maybe reflected in the pages of the book. And and I wanted to speak to communities about uh, or share the stories of parents with faith communities about how these families may be feeling um, give them a, a place to speak openly, um, because of course all of the participants are are anonymous within the nature of the book, um, so they can speak openly and perhaps have their stories heard by by the broader community, and and we can begin the conversation about then how to create more welcoming spaces for for people with disabilities and and by extension their families and their parents, their caregivers. So that that was really sort of how. I engaged both the project and the book was it was very much from a place of someone who had lived the story and wanted to to speak back to the community from that place of experience rather than engaging in, in a more uh, academic dialogue. Not that there isn't a place for that, but I I wanted um, I wanted the initial conversation to be more broadly accessible to to people who are in the community. Or that was my hope, at least. Um, and Alan and I, I think, worked really hard to try to reflect that in in how we wrote about the project. Great. Um, that's helpful. And I'm hoping in this next part, and you can also maybe brings up a story or two that that it that is staying with you. So along with that maybe talk about the themes of the book and especially this this idea of images of the church and how you co-created and you played, played with, with these images. I can talk real quick to the images just for starting. So um, Laura and I both have had the privilege of working with Tom O'Connor, um, now retired. He's a professor emeritus at Luther. Um, who's kind of uh, an expert in qualitative research. And and I know on another project I worked with, he also talked about uh, the power of image and inviting uh, informants to to use an image to get to the the research question. So um, very early in our conversation, Laura and I both agreed that this would be a a helpful um, and powerful way to... um, to access people's experience, their lived experience. I think one of the things that, I mean, that I found often when I've asked this question in this and other studies is people kind of have this bit of a deer in the headlight look when you first ask what's an image and they'll, they might say something to the effect of, gee, I can't think of anything. And then something falls out of their mouth. That's just brilliant. Um, And I think one of the, the things I love about, about the image question is it's a bit of a moment for, um, you know, drawing on on the left side of the brain um, and kind of um, sort of accessing a part of you that um, isn't always ready right there when you're thinking and, you know, going through the kind of the logical, rational piece of conversations. And it just, um, 
I think it's a real invitation. And we that certainly bore out. The images that came were were potent. Um, we used uh, six, I think. Uh, there's we had 20 interviews. There was some overlap of some of the of some of the images, but um, there's more. We could have had more chapters. So, yeah. Can you describe one of the image and maybe a story that went with that? Sure, I can start with one and maybe Alan might want to jump in with one as well. So one of the ones that really stood out for me and is I think the opening chapter or opening image that we begin the book with is the description of a cruise ship and a dinghy. And so we asked people to describe their relationship with ch church in an image and then to essentially with words paint that image for us. And as Alan said, people often begin with a, a bit of a surprised look, though we had given the questions to them ahead of time, but often really then become engaged with the image. So uh, the woman, it was a woman who was answering this question, began to describe this cruise ship and the cruise ship, um, you know, has people on it and they're going someplace and it's comfortable. And, and she described the fact that really they wanted to be on the cruise ship, but that they were in a dinghy. And, and she said the dinghy in some ways was going about the same speed and going to the same place, but they couldn't, they couldn't get into the larger community. They couldn't be part of what was happening in the larger community. Um, and, and, and then that really brought out themes of both accessibility, that perhaps the cruise ship wasn't accessible either physically, but also in other ways, like attitudinally. Um, but that also that, that, that there wasn't a place for them. There were questions of welcome or exclusion and, and images of exclusion came up quite frequently. Um, yeah. And so that, that was one image that really stood out for me. And I know that I've played with the dinghy and the cruise ship theme in some conversations I've had since the research project concluded. Um, but there's, there were many to work with that was, that was one that was just really illustrative of, of both inaccessibility and exclusion. Yeah. Um, the, the, the one that most immediately comes to mind for me is um, the, the next one, which is the, the pointed finger. And that one was, uh, was proposed by uh, someone I interviewed um, and their story was just so utterly painful um, and um, I still have shivers. Um, I remember um, journaling after the interview and just talking about going, I needed to go for a run because it was so upsetting, but this woman told the story of, of um, she'd been a, a a long member of of the church. Uh, this was she. This was young. They were young in their marriage when they had their child. Um, and the church had sort of been the place where they did their premarital counseling. This was the church. The pastor who did the premarital counseling spoke about wanting to journey with them through life. This was their place. These were their people. Um, regularly um, supportive. There's lots of interaction. Um, and then um, and presence during the pregnancy until the birth of their child with these severe disabilities and all of a sudden um, the church sort of disappeared. Their, their life was very complicated um, but when they finally got back to church after you know the child was I think three or four months old or something like that um, you know the, the reception was just horrible and the pastor came to the couple immediately after the service and told them next time they need to sit at the back because the child was too distracting. And um, it was intimated that uh, this child was um, born with disabilities because of their sin. Um, and so this was a woman who uh, then identified the church as a pointed finger. Um, that, that was just so powerful and painful um, and her experience was, um, I mean, she is still living with it, as you can well imagine. Um, and in a way, I'm still processing this interview, um, as I will be for, I think, the rest of my life. But it, that, that image itself was, um, I think, really spoke to, 
the experience of too many people, even though they used other images. Another common image that sort of spoke about this was a, there was a few different people who used the picture of uh, the church as a circle um, of people who are smiling at one another, um, chatting, and they're on the outside tapping shoulders trying to get in. Um, and that also was a, um, a, a recurring and problematic image that sort of re reflects that pointed finger piece. Yeah, the, the image, images describing exclusion were uh, significant and uh, came up frequently. So we had images of locked doors, we had images of circles, images of exclusive um, exclusive uh, environments like a cruise ship. We had people talk about needing a membership card. Um, I, I thought it might be helpful to share, though, one more positive image. Well, a lot of the images described themes of exclusion. There was a really rich story that explored the idea of a mask, so concealing the true nature of the church. Um, well, they put on a particular image that underneath behind the mask perhaps was a more excluding a more excluding face. But there were some some more favorable ones. And one of the ones that I really enjoyed hearing about was someone described the church as a tree. And, and they talked about how um, their faith community really planted the tree and allowed sort of the roots to take hold such that when they left their faith community, because they were one, one of the families that had left, they had this sort of vibrant living tree that allowed them to sustain their own faith and their own spiritual life. Um, and that they could then continue to nurture this sort of this living being. Um, through their own efforts. Um, so it really it really spoke to the resilience I felt of faith, um, even absent a faith community and and people's deep need for a spiritual life, um, even without a faith community, to the point that they would then develop a lot of really rich and meaningful practices to nurture that tree or whatever the image that they chose to play with. So there were some some really positive stories as well, though I would say, um, and I would look to Alan as well to, to sort of maybe confirm this, but I would say that the majority were were conflicted or outright uh, negative, um, but not all. Yeah, that, I completely agree. Um, and actually, even the ones that were positive had their had some pretty harsh things to say in the middle of it. Uh, another one that was somewhat more positive and it kind of woven a couple of different ways was. Um, well, one that comes up in the book is the image of the church's warm bread and sort of related uh, was another uh, person spoke about um, working in the kitchen, uh, the re reflection of the kitchen or another person sp spoke about sitting at a kitchen table in the conversation. And so I've, some, I've since thought a little bit more about um, how powerful that image of the kitchen is for the church. Uh, the church is a kitchen. I don't I'm not sure where I go with it, but it is something that I've been sort of starting to think a bit about um, as a kind of a, as a, and kitchens are so incredibly important places. I mean, growing up, this was, this was the place. I mean, more than the living room or whatever, the kitchen is where community takes place. And so I found that to be powerful. Um, and I think on the reverse side is, um, you know, people who aren't feeling fed or um, feeling pushed out of the conversation. I think it's kind of the reverse of that. So there's a bit of both of those. Right, and I think one of the sort of a final comment that I would add maybe before we move forward is that even those people who attended church regularly and faithfully often described really conflicted relationships with church and described images that captured that conflicted, uh, complicated relationship. So even people who would have initially identified as in a relationship, using the Facebook language again, with church, once we started talking, it became pretty apparent that, that the relationship was complicated and conflicted um, for many of these people involved in this, the, the interview. Well, thanks so much for that. It really helps us to get inside the book a lot more and also see a little bit behind the curtain of your um, your work as researchers. We wanted to ask you how your images of the church have shifted after writing this book. Um, you know, if we were to turn the question to you both now and and ask you what your, your image of the church is, um, would you be willing to share with us if you have any insights? 
Uh, Alan, did anything, did this question sure, anything sure. for you? Yeah, yeah. It, the, the problem is it's there, it's images. <laughs> image. um, yeah, there's been a lot. I, I, one of the interesting, um, well, let me say two things um, and then I'll pass it to Laura and we can pick it up from there as well. Um, so the, the, one, the one piece is um, I'm increasingly understanding that the church, when it's authentic, understands itself to be a disabled church. Um, so its members um, all, I think, in some way or another, um, are living or will live into disability. Um, we're constituted as such. So I think we lie to ourselves. We pretend we're not um, as a, it's part of the culture we live in. It's part of our you know, failure to be true to our, ourselves. So I think that's one thing. The other one that I think is a bit more surprising and um, I was just sort of, this just sort of popped in my head the other day is one of the images that comes to me of the church coming out of this study is a picture of people leaving the church. So the church, so it's a bit of a paradoxical image, but in some ways, the church that I saw that was most authentic in the conversations we had were people who walked away from the church, recognizing that the church really starts in your heart. And um, in your heart of hearts, you need to follow what you know to be best for you, your child, your family. And sometimes the place the church starts is when people uh, walk away from the church because it's a dangerous place for them to be. Um, that's a really hard thing to, to say and to know. But um, I think some of these people have had experiences where they have to do exact, exactly that. And I think that's kind of, they're authentically being church when they come to the decision, I need to get out of here. Yeah, thanks for that, Alan. That's a, that's a great description, actually. I'll admit that I've I've struggled with this question, and I'm one of those people that that if and when I'm asked the question of how to think in an image, I'm I'm absolutely the deer in the headlights. So I'm not particularly skilled at these answers, but I think, you know, I would certainly agree with Alan if I were to stop and and have to craft my own image of what church is to me and what it maybe evolved to be as I'm doing this project. Um, I would have answered, you know, the church is is not sort of the walls of the building, but is the world, and it's it's sort of how we live and engage in the world. Um, but I think if I had to stop and think, okay, well, what is my image of the church as we did this project, um, and then perhaps in response to this project, and in some of the conversations I've had with faith communities to speak about this project, because Alan and I have been privileged to speak about the project with faith communities, um, I almost get the image of of someone creating images. So the church is sort of standing and they've got maybe colored pencils and they're trying to craft, a, they're trying to color a picture of what they are. And there's almost a, nope, that's not. And they throw it over their shoulder and they start again and they sort of redraft and say, okay, well, you know, this time we're going to try this. Um, and then no, they they sort of throw it out. And I think to me where the disappointment is then is the church is trying to find sort of an maybe a singular answer or a straightforward answer or an answer um, for how they can they can be uh, radically in inclusive. They can be welcoming to people with disabilities and they, they're not perhaps understanding that there isn't one image, there isn't one answer. It's an ongoing conversation. It's an ongoing dialogue that, you know, and that part that is because if we're we're going to stop and think theologically about this you know if we are created if we are imago dei and created in god's image that means we are radically and wildly diverse and so there's no good singular answer there's many 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 images and the church needs to just sort of stretch itself to be crafting these images to be co-creating these images with its diverse body um so i think that's sort of where i'd go um yeah, so again, a really complicated and, and maybe multi-image answer. Uh, the other, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, no, thanks, Miriam. Um, the other piece that I would pull into the puzzle is um, thinking about body and bodies. Um, the image of the church is body and bodies, um, which, of course, is, you know, the church is the body of Christ is a longstanding trope in the church. Um, but paradoxically, or tragically, really more than paradoxically, um, the church 
becomes hostile to the body. Um, and so how can we bring the body back into the church? I think that's one of the things I liked about the image question was um, it was a, it's a bit more visceral. Um, it gets people kind of out of their mind and out of their head in a little bit. Um, or better yet, it invites us to move from head and mind to body mind, like trying to think of us in terms of our singularity. So how can we how can we re-embody that picture of the church as a body? Um, and I really like, um, so I've been doing a little bit of work around carnal her hermeneutics and, and the importance of touch and skin and um, the porosity of the skin and how uh, this, you know, this largest organ in our body is porous. And so, um, yeah, I think that that uh, the church that's authentic is is both is it has the world leaking into it and it has itself leaking out into the world. Uh, so I think leakage would be another uh, word I might like to think about it in terms of church images, the leaking church. Anti body damage. I've played with leaking a bit myself because it's often used in disability studies. So, yeah, I think of the leaking body of the disabled Christ and how his wounds leak into the disciples and and change them and how those he met um the hemorrhaging woman and so on whose bodies leak into his and, and change him. Yeah, not to go with yeah, thank Um, I wanted to add in another question and then we can get us back on track. But what you said you've shared some of this with communities of faith, and I wonder what their response has. I guess again, I'll look to Alan. I think my experience has been largely favorable. Um, the places where we've been invited to speak or I've been invited to speak are, are communities that are really um, grappling with um, questions of inclusion and, and that's a problematic word for me, but we can talk about that uh, if you want. But but sort of really struggling with what does it mean to be radically welcoming? What does it mean to make sure that church uh, genuinely is a place for all people and all bodies? Um, and so I, I think, you know, if they've been asking Alan or I to be part of the conversation, it often means that they're they're really often they're wrestling with the question and they're they're genuinely interested in um in hearing the answers because the answers sometimes are are hard to hear we were talking we're telling a lot of stories which um isn't they don't always paint church in a favorable light um and those that can be really hard to hear um particularly if you're on the cruise ship and i i played with this metaphor in one of the talks i gave if you're one of the people who's on the cruise ship rather than the dinghy and you look around and you see familiar comfort and you see friendly people and community um and you you think oh i just have to say people come on in um without realizing that people then have to adapt to the norms of the community of the cruise ship um it, it, when you're the one who really loves that space, it can be hard to understand why other people maybe aren't feeling the same way. And so those can be difficult conversations, but in my experience, they've gone really well. People are really engaged and, uh, and want to talk about it. Um, I'll, I'll turn it to Alan and he might have other thoughts. Yeah, no, a couple of things. I th and I think in some ways um, what you're saying reflects the, 
experience of some of um, our informants, our participants in, they loved their churches. Like they absolutely adored them. These were, these, this was home. And when all of a sudden home becomes a dangerous place, like how do you reconcile that? It's um, so people don't want to hear that what they love so much is actually a dangerous place for some people. Um, so I think that that's, that's one piece. I think, yeah, I, uh, the, the people who are, the communities that are asking um, for these conversations are already um, working in the journey towards uh, justice. And I think that's, I'm mindful of the many churches that don't ask for, for uh, you know, for the conversation. Um, I'm also mindful, um, I say this over and over again, that institutions are institutions and they always take care of institutions. So that's a that's just a hard truth that those of us who live in the institutions have to have to face. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I've often used the example of justice work is like um, uh, going up a down escalator. As soon as you pause, you're going in the wrong direction. Um, and it takes energy and and it's just sometimes quite disheartening to do this work. So, um, yeah, I think those are a couple of the, I, I don't want to be negative, but I think we also need to be realistic about this, that there's a lot of, there's a lot of faith communities that are, really aren't interested because they're quite comfortable. Um, and uh, it, it's hard, it's hard work for people. So, but, you know, again, the other piece of the puzzle is I've sometimes, uh, my elevator speech for what I learned from this uh, from this project is um, it's a good news, bad news, good news story. Um, the good news is that uh, these families of uh, raising children with disabilities, um, they're spiritually interested and they, they, they're, they're hungry for what the church has to offer. They recognize in the church something valuable. They recognize spirit. They know the, the, you know, the message of Jesus is one of um, an invitation to be participants in God's unconditional love. So they're they're interested in that. The bad news is the church is rife with ableism and is uh, living the exact opposite of the gospel. Um, but I like to also end on the good news is that you know churches that are repent that repent of ableism um, be, can and are places where um, that more fulsome image of the church as a disabled body that's living the you know the diversity of God's beautiful creation. Um, can be incarnate, it can be real. Um, and so I think that that's an important piece for us to all be thinking of, not to lose that eschatological hope in the midst of the messiness that, um, and the, the, yeah, the abuse that can be institutional. I will, I just sort of on a, another more practical maybe note, uh, I, one of the conversations that I found really interesting is that well, churches were were really engaged, the ones that invited us and wanted to, to have these conversations. Many didn't understand inspirational porn. And so many believed that they were, uh, were very welcoming for people with disabilities in their families and held them up as these um, very meaningful and inspirational uh, stories and, and struggle to understand why that was problematic when those conversations came up and that, uh, you know, the discussions around people with disabilities didn't want to be inspirational tropes, um, but really wanted to be active and valued members of the community um, and be able to offer their unique contributions to the life and work of the church, um, to have their unique gifts and leadership skills, um, you know, welcomed and included um, and, and integrated into the meaningful work of the church. And, and that they didn't want to, to sort of represent these um, sort of unidimensional sort of stories that were ultimately used to prop up the spiritual needs of other people. Um, and and so that was often a real learning for churches. Um, and again, people were really interested in that conversation and often were genuinely surprised that um, that, that was a difficult um, and problematic way to talk about disability. Well, thanks so much, Laura and Alan. That really helps us to understand the book a bit more and get more inside of it. Um, we wanted to ask you, as you're reflecting upon um, the book and uh, what some of the participants told you, what would you recommend that parents do who have kids with disabilities who've experienced the same kind of spiritual abuse 
that you talk about in the book, um, what would you recommend that they do? What are some practical things? Alan, you had talked a little bit about leaving. And sometimes that is something that must be done for safety and for, for other reasons. But what else can they do? Does anybody have any thoughts? I think my immediate answer would be speak up. Um, tell your story, make your needs known, um, and and don't apologize. Uh, you know, you are you know, you, you as a family or as an individual have every right to be in that space um, and to tell the world what you need so that you can safely be in that space. And if you're not getting an answer that is affirming and, and welcoming and uh, really trying to make sure that that space is safe and, and welcoming and, and celebrates the unique contributions of your, your, your loved one with a disability or your family, um, be honest about that. Um, I, I know as a, as a, so I'll, I'm in some ways I, I can't not answer that, this question as someone who lived it. Like I, I, I'm immediately sort of in that space where yes, I'm a researcher who, who, uh, can integrate the results, but I'm also really speaking from, uh, a, a parent who lived this as well. Um, you know, understand that the divine does not live in the church. It lives wherever you are and wherever you're doing the work of the church. And if the church isn't creating that safe space for you, and unsafe was a word that came up a lot in this research. Um, the lack of safety in churches was discussed openly and often. And if you're not finding that safety, then, then you know, I think it is reasonable to leave. Um, and, and you should do that in a guilt-free way. Um, but I also think that, um, and, and Erin Rafferty in her book does a really excellent job of speaking about this, speak about what you need, but, but don't let the church paint you as a problem to be solved or to engage you in some kind of transactional relationship where they respond only if you show up, um, there. So, you know, I think I want to tell parents to be and again, I'm speaking primarily to parents here, be bold, be audacious, be clear, um, and expect the church to show up um, in a way that is gracious and welcoming um, and is not transactional. Alan, what would you add? Those are, that's really helpful. Thanks. Um, I think a couple of things come to mind. One thing is I think it's probably helpful on a pretty regular basis to look in the mirror and to look at yourself and say, I'm a gift of God. Um, I have something to offer, um, and that gives you a place from which to do um, this kind of work that you need to do as a, as a parent with disability or a person with disability in, the, in a faith community. Um, a couple other things that were recurring motifs in the, in the conversations were language of advo advocacy, um, so finding allies in your community, people who um, you can share your story with, uh, that you've that can help you then in this work. The, the other one, um, I was just sort of going over my notes a little bit in preparation for this was the theme of mentorship loomed quite large. A lot of, a lot of um, parents were looking for mentors. Some were sort of now becoming mentors. So I think uh, thinking about how you can do mentorship, how you can find allies, um, probably uh, it would probably be helpful um, across communities so I mean we've talked a little bit about in terms of within my church what would I do but uh, what can we do across churches how can people um, how can people uh, form communities outside of the church um, that are kind of out of particular churches that are uh, places where they can um, do do and find the kind of support they need so when they return to their own church they have some sort of new energy and ideas and possibilities. I also, if I may, sorry, oh, please, please, please. I'll jump in and, and say, I'd like to, to sort of expand this question and the answer to not just what can parents and kids do, or parents in particular families do. I'm a little worried that we're placing the responsibility 
on the families, on the individuals with a disability, on the individuals who are living in unsafe environments, who are living with, in some cases, spiritual abuse. And, and yes, their voices absolutely must be heard. We need to create safe spaces where they can tell their stories and where people will hear those stories. But I would speak to faith communities and faith leaders as well and say, um, you know, it is not up to the individuals to be the voices here to solve the problem that that faith communities and leadership need to be accepting responsibility and the educational institutions that came up frequently the need for people who take on these leadership roles to to actually do courses in um in disability ethics and caregiving ethics and and to my knowledge those are not uh, a significant part of the training of faith leaders and so, you know, it is also incumbent upon the larger institutional structures and the leaders to to be taking these these um, concerns of the families and the individuals, uh, both people who are raising children with disabilities and people who live with disabilities, very seriously, um, and and not put the individuals or the families in the position where they are the ones who constantly need to be advocating, who constantly need to be speaking up and ultimately be educating larger structures about what needs to be done. So I would also sort of wanna open that question up and say, what's the bigger picture here? Who else is responsible for, for sort of creating change? Yeah, I might just add, oh, sorry, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna add one thing quickly, if you don't mind. Um, I think it also points, uh, Laura, just to riff on what you were saying to the institution, um, the responsibility that the institution has to go to survivors or people with disabilities uh, because they are the experts on their own lives. They are the experts on what they need um, instead of uh, having more of sort of like a paternalistic or dictatorial way of saying, well, this is what you need. Um, so uh, you both have modeled such a beautiful way of going to the parents themselves and asking them what has been your experience and how can we help so and uh alan sorry you're about to say something there no that's that's fine that's what was, yeah that that actually was very helpful thanks for that um yeah a recurring uh, theme from a few different uh, conversations was um well I, I like in particular one person said you know it's really not rocket science <laughs> um ask listen when people speak and then act um, and I would just simply add to that, all of this presumes that we're uh, looking about us to see who's there and, and recognizing that there's, um, there's wisdom in the room um, and then being humble enough to, to seek it out. So I think that's part of the puzzle. So where can people buy a copy of this? Amazing helpful book. Doesn't Amy get to answer that question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we have um, different ways you can buy uh, the book. You can head over to our webpage uh, for the press, which is madandcrypttheologypress.ca. And you'll be able to see a link to purchase the book on our website. You can also, uh, we've formatted it for Kindle as well, if you prefer that um, way of, of interacting with books. So you can pop over on Amazon and uh, Amazon Canada and buy that book. Um, we also, as a as the, the press wants to make some copies available to faith communities free of charge, if you're if you've heard this podcast and you're like, man, I really love to get a copy of that, um, contact me, contact me, pop on to madencrypttheologypress.ca and uh, send me a message and we'll be able to send a copy to you. Um, so you can check it out and see if it's something that you'd want to either order a copy for your church library if you're thinking of like doing small group study with this book, because that's how the book is actually put together. There's, I think, is it eight weeks? I think it's eight weeks um, uh, where you journey together and you read these stories and everybody sits and talks about it. So if that's something that sounds like you'd like to do uh, in small groups, uh, we'd be happy to get a copy into your hands. Um, I might also mention just before we wrap up that if you want to read sort of more of the scholarly side of this study, if that is something that uh, you really enjoy 
doing and dig a little bit more into the numbers and sort of like the like thinking about the research side you can also check out Laura and Alan's article that they wrote for the journal so that gives a little bit more I think a little bit more um yeah of a scholarly uh look and so it's called Beyond Saints and Superheroes, a ph phenomenological study of the spiritual care needs of parents raising children with disabilities. And so that was published in the spring issue of the journal, and you can check that out. I'll just also add to that that uh, Laura and I and Tom Reynolds are working on an edited volume called Disrupting Church Images that are drawing upon the study as well. So that's, that's a little bit down the road, but you can keep your eyes out for that. Um, and hopefully, um, yeah, that, that, that should be hopefully a, a useful resources for churches and the, and the academy both. And hopefully we can have you all back on uh, once that book is published and you can we can have a chit chat about that, too. Yeah, and I was just going to add that I know um, I'd be happy uh, if, if churches or communities are reading the book or want to talk about the book or want to engage in a conversation about the research project, I'm always happy to either pop by churches via Zoom or if they are within an hour of, say, the Kitchener-Waterloo region. I'm happy to, to pop by and have a conversation and talk about the research project. Um, and I can be reached uh, really through, through Amy at the press. So, yeah, thank you. I'd also be happy to do that. And um, you can catch me by email at a Jorgensen, um, just like you see it on the screen at wlu.ca. Wonderful. We'll put your info along with the podcast episode so people can find it. There. Well, thank you so much for all your work in this book. For Lauren Allen for journeying with, with your co creators and telling their stories and, and hopefully creating hope that churches can become what Jesus imagined, their, their open table. And thank you to Amy for all her work in, in publishing and editing with Laura and Alan. And thank you to all of you for listening today. We'll see you again in about a month, usually. Take care.